Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's clinical webcast, Cracking the Code, the Definitive Program on Coding and Compliance of Dry Eye by Dr. John Rumpakis. My name is Carver. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Enter your questions at any time, and I'll address your questions to Dr. Rumpakis throughout the presentation, and we'll discuss any remaining questions at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. John Rumpakis. He is the president and CEO of uh, Practice Resource Management Incorporated, a firm that specializes in providing a full array of consulting, appraisal, and management services for healthcare professionals and industry partners. In addition to founding the industry-leading cloud applications CodeSafePlus.com and JustAskJohn.net, he is the chief medical coding editor for many of the lead eye care publications. Dr. Rampakis is considered one of the leading authorities in the U.S. on the topics of medical coding and compliance, strategy development and execution, practice development, team building, maximizing effectiveness and profitability, including authoring the textbook, Business Aspects of Optometry. I'm personally excited for tonight's webcast because I receive a decent number of coding questions from doctors just like yourselves, and I'm looking forward to improving my own understanding of the subject tonight. Welcome, Dr. Rampakis. Thanks, Carver. Hi, everybody. Thanks for spending your Tuesday late afternoon or evening with me, uh, depending on where you are at around the country. Um, hope everybody is going through the reopening phase pretty well and coming out of it okay, and most importantly, staying safe and staying healthy and protecting your staff and your patients. I'm really excited about uh, being here as a guest of Oculus tonight to talk about coding and compliance with dry eye. You know, it seems that uh, out of all of the different things that we have going on, dry eye has really maintained itself as one of the leading areas of subspecialization in eye care. And it's one of those things that even during this pandemic with the, you know, craziness of are you going to be open, not going to be open, telehealth, all those sorts of things. It's one of those things that you can still deliver follow-up care pretty effectively via telehealth, being that it's an anterior segment type of a uh, disease state. So we're going to cover a lot of the basics regarding coding. We're going to talk about compliance rules. We're going to talk about economics more importantly than everything and, and talk about why dry eye, if it's not already a vital part of your practice, it should be uh, going forward. Just a couple of things I always have to do as disclosures. Uh, I'm a consultant. I'm not an employee of any of the companies that you see here, but I do provide consulting services for them on an ongoing basis and to get paid based upon a project-based uh, basis on, on doing things. It's also kind of cool because it gives me the inside scoop on a lot of new technologies coming to the market. And, and most of these companies reach out to me to help understand how to get paid or how to help doctors get paid for their services or establishing a CPT code or establishing category three code or understanding what diagnoses are covered by a specific procedure code. So we'll get into all of that as we go forward. Uh, as Carver said, I do write for a lot of the publications. I do have ownership interests in the um, uh, uh, wholly owned ownership interests in the companies on the bottom of your screen uh, on what I do there, but uh, not real pertinent tonight. Um, everything that is going to be talked about tonight is factual. So everything is going to, when I show you fees later on in the presentation, it's going to be based upon the uh, CMS maximum allowable uh, the average values uh, as of August 4th uh, today, right? And any information regarding policies and guidelines is going to be current as of today as well. One important thing to remember, though, that depending on where you practice, different carriers have different rules and different carriers have different reimbursements as well. So that's why I'm using averages. And if your state policy differs uh, based upon your zip code and it differs based upon something I say, that could totally be true. And if you'd like to make sure we get additional verification on things, here's my email address. Um, this is my personal email address. You're happy to email me any questions that come up. Um, please just tell me where you heard me. Just say, hey, I was on the Oculus webinar and I heard you say this and I live in Virginia and or practice in Virginia and here's the question that I had. That way, when I answer the question, I can give you a zip code specific answer for you. So that way it can be absolutely appropriate for your geography. One quick, uh, one quick thing I want to say about as far as kind of the rules of engagement for tonight. Any question regarding coding and dry eye, 
is welcome. If you have coding questions outside of dry eye, if you have a retinal coding question or something like that, just use my email address and email me privately and I'll be happy to answer that for you. But I'd like to keep our Q&A tonight uh, centered around our primary topic. So with that being said, let's kind of talk about some of the basics. Now, I know that when I talk about things like the Affordable Care Act, people go, oh my God, that was you know six, seven years ago. Are we still talking about this, this sort of thing? Well, we have to, why? Right? Because that's still the, lay, the law of the land as we have it today. And it's forced a lot of different changes that have gone on and how we're getting paid for providing specialty care to our patients. If you recall, the pillars of the ACA, that which have, there were six, were having essential health benefits for everybody, employers had to offer health coverage, individuals had to have health coverage, there is a whole lot of cost shifting going on. When I mean cost shifting, shifting costs from the federal government and Medicare back to the consumer of the care itself. And you notice that all other third party carriers also went with that as well. It was designed primarily to reduce utilization and to create a new payment system where physicians were based upon or getting compensated based upon their quality outcomes rather than the number of services. Now we've seen some shifts and changes in that with MIPS and MACRA and all the different types of things going on. But what we want to focus on is what hasn't happened. So you've seen cost shifting, right? Deductibles have increased, right? Individuals, as of January 2018, that went away. So <clears throat> That no longer is part of the ACA and employers offering health coverage as a must was never actually implemented. So what were we left with? We were left with higher deductibles, basic coverage of which eye care really doesn't participate in other than the pediatric uh, eye exam benefit. And we no longer have young individuals feeding the system with their premium dollars to help afford the care uh, that all of the older folks out here actually need. So we've got a system that's pretty fragile. And when we talk about what's going on with payers and things like that, it does present some challenges overall. But we're really gonna focus on the three big things when we talk about it. There's coding, right? There's coverage and there's reimbursement. Now, a lot of times people get these things confused. So remember coding is nothing more than translating the patient physician encounter into a five digit code that legally describes what you've done with the patient, right? So when you say you've did a, done, done a comprehensive eye exam, a 92004, we can open up the CPT book and the CPT book has a specific definition of that service. If I did a 65222, removal of a corneal forum body, that has a very specific definition and rule sets that go along with it. So remember, coding is nothing more than translating what the doctor did during the encounter. And that goes for special procedures as well that your text may administer. Coverage is what? Where a carrier establishes a policy on how they're going to pay us. They may set other types of things in their policies as well. Things like utilization schedules. I can only do this a couple of times a year. Or I can only do this particular test if the predicate tests show that there's something going on. So I have to have medical necessity established for doing things. Reimbursement is how much you've agreed to get paid for a given procedure that you've coded and that has coverage, right? So if you want to think of coverage, think about it as payment assistance, right? That's really what insurance is. There's no insurance out there that covers everything. In fact, the average deductible today is nearly 7,700 bucks uh, per person out there right? That's a lot of money. So what ends up happening is most people are still paying for their procedures out of pocket because it's only catastrophic care that generally gets people over to the top of satisfying their deductible. And, you know, added to that is that they still have to pay their premium costs on, on top of that, um, you know, so they start to think about what their care really costs. It's really astronomical uh, as far as how we, we are, we're postured in the world uh, lens. So we'll talk about these three things and we'll make sure that we kind of break everything down into that. Now, all three of these things come under the umbrella of legally required compliance. And what do I mean by that? Well, HIPAA require, that was passed in 1996 requires that we follow the rules of the CPT book and it requires that we follow the rules of the ICD-10. So that becomes law when we have to start doing that. What else happens when we start to understand that we have to have medical necessity and we've signed a contract with the carrier and we have to do different things, that is also a legally required issue. 
reimbursement. When I sign a contract and it says I'm a participating part, uh, provider and I've agreed to accept so much money for a particular procedure, that also is legally binding. So all of these things have a legal aspect to them as well. It's not just billing for something so you can get paid, right? Everything's based upon the care that you actually provide to the patient. Now, why do you have to pay attention to all three? Because the ramifications for not paying attention to them are pretty severe. I'm not going to make this lecture about audits. That's a whole different, <laughs> whole different topic area. But let's just say that the average audit today, and I do audit defense as part of my business, the average audit today, whether it's from VSP or Medicare, it doesn't matter, is easily into the mid six figures. So 150, 200, 275, $500,000 is what they generally try to get back if you don't pay attention to the three things we just talked about. Coding properly, coming into uh, compliance with um, how you're doing, uh, you know, everything under the contract, and then making sure that you're following payment rules appropriately. So when I talk about coding, right, I always tell people don't worry about coding. Coding is the last thing you need to worry about. The most important thing to worry about is providing the standard of care or above the standard of care for your patient. You never want to go below the standard of care, right? So when we talk about what do you do with the patient, remember the patient's condition and how they present to your office, whether they come in organically saying that they have a problem with their eyes. Number two, they come in for a routine exam and you discover that they have a problem with their eyes. Or three, that they're referred from another office because you're a specialist in this particular area. That patient presentation determines what you do with that patient, right? And so you take a certain type of history, you do a certain type of exam based upon that history, you now assess that condition, you may order additional tests based upon the examination that you did and the findings that you had, and then you're going to create a plan, right, that's going to create the best outcome. All of those things, if you're doing things properly, are recorded into your EHR. Once you've recorded things into your EHR, now you have all of the elements that you need to be able to code your encounter and your procedures properly matched with the diagnosis that you've discovered that drove you to doing those other types of tests or procedures, right? So the patient actually determines what you're doing with them. And I'm going to say this a couple of times during the course of the lecture, and we have a closing slide on it. But what we have to also learn to do is to stop practicing to the level of our patient's insurance coverage, right? Patients need to be informed. Patients need care. Your primary responsibility is not being their gatekeeper. It's not being their banker. It's not being their financial analyst. Their, your primary responsibility is being their eye doctor. And recommending, it's doing tests, it's recommending treatment protocols, and it's making sure the patients understand all of their options, and what your best recommendations are for solving their problem. Their payment assistance that they have through their third party will help them to afford the care that you're recommending, okay? You don't want to conform your care to just what their coverage is, okay? Because they could still have problems that are ongoing, and if you modify that, you could have liability associated with that because you made decisions for the patient instead of letting the patient make their own decisions on their care. So remember, the individual patient presentation or what you have them returning for to your office determines what you do with them. And what you do uh, determines what you do. It determines the services that you performed and the coding of those services. The most important question that you can always ask a patient, and this should be the very first thing that's recorded in the record. Why does the patient need to see me today? right? Why are they in my chair now? And if they're a returning patient, why are you bringing the patient back? So when you're bringing the patient back, that should be recorded two places in the record. One as part of your plan from the prior visit, and then that getting transcribed to your chief complaint for the visit that they're there for that day. So if you're, say, patient, you know, returning in three months for follow-up on, you know, ocular surface disease, whatever it may be, and when the patient comes back, patient returning per doctor directed orders for follow up on ocular surface disease or maintenance of medication, whatever it may be, right? So now I've got a record that is airtight as far as uh, why are they there and who's gonna be covering that. If we start to look at the flow of a visit, right? The patient presents, you determine what they're there for, 
the staff triages them. And, and what I mean by that is they get the appropriate information, all the demographics, all of that type of thing. But they also are determining, right, why the patient is there are is now going to determine the resources. That means staff, equipment, space, and time, right? All of those types of things you have to start to determine. You as a physician have the easy job, right? You only have to do three things. What type of your exam are you going to do based upon the patient's presentation, right? The chief complaint drives the type of encounter that you're going to do. It also drives the level of examination that you do with that in combination with the history that you perform. Then those two things together are now going to say, hey, do I also need to order additional testing? And also when you order that and where it comes in the sequence is very important. And we'll get into the difference between standing orders and non-standing orders on how that can be very successful in dry eye. If we do all of these things, then we've got a very, very successful encounter overall. So some of the basic legalities related to compliance, okay? But here's the things that I really see coming up quite a bit when I, when I help people in audits. Are they performing care that they have established medical necessity for? And when I say they have established medical necessity, you need to record that in the record. You need to have a clinical finding and demonstrate why you need to order a particular test. Why am I ordering my biography, right? And coding it as such and billing somebody as such and getting paid for it. I have to be able to have a reason for that, right? If a third party is going to pay for that. I can only bill for services that I've actually performed right? I have to make sure that my records are accurate, complete, and always show a narrative about that patient's care. And remember, every time you submit a CMS 1500 form, that's your, um, you know, your insurance form that you submit to a carrier, or if you do it electronically, it's called a 437. If you're doing that, that's actually a contract, right? And the contract says, by you attesting with your signature, that you will face penalties or ramifications for false information. So the fundamental principles, right, at the heart of our system are what do you do with the patient? Think evidence-based medicine, right? You got a lot of clinical information out there that says if a patient shows with this or this, this is the clinical path that you would go. What is the patient's needs, not what do you need to do? And where does that come up? So if I'm doing a dry eye workup, right, and you hear a lot of people talk about their dry eye workups, and I do the same eight tests on every patient that has dry eye. I would tell you that is completely inappropriate to do. You need to approach everything based on an individual basis because you don't do it based on diagnosis, right? The diagnosis is important and it's gonna lead you into certain testing, but you have to determine as an individual patient which tests they require because every patient has different personal history, different medical uh, you know, medications that they take, family history, all of that sort of thing that will help you determine what you need to do. And then last, but most important, is what's in the patient's best interest overall. Now let's get into the CPT codes. And, you know, everybody always talks about the different forms of CPT codes, and yet I find my still have to explain to people what the differences are as types of codes. So let's just kind of talk about them, because every code <coughs> within the healthcare professional coding system, that's HCPCS or HCPCS system, has a subset and its own implicit purpose, right? So... Remember that the, uh, the level one CPT codes or HCPCS codes are CPT codes. We have level two, we have category three, and then we have the ICD-10 codes. All of the procedural codes that we use in the country here to describe what we do are owned and licensed by the American Medical Association. The ICD-10 codes are licensed and copyrighted by the World Health Organization. So again, just kind of breaking things down, CPT codes, non-CPT codes, and then emerging technology. What's most important for you to recognize is the process or the policies that go along with each one of these codes. So if I look at CPT codes, they're always five uh, digits, right? You know, 92004, whatever it may be, always five digits. Remember, CPT codes have definitions. They have relative value units. They have policies surrounding them and all of that sort of thing. If I go to a level two code, right, it's an alphanumeric. It's letters A through V followed by four numbers. That describes generally materials that we use. So like a scleral contact lens or something like that that you might use uh, for treating ocular surface disease. Um, it's going to have a letter followed by four numbers. 
And then we're going to get into category three codes because the cool part about dry eye is, is that there's a lot of new technology that's coming out. And as this new technology is in the process of applying for a CPT code, they generally get assigned what we call a category three code. Category three code has a three to five year lifetime and it's assigned a temporary code to use for submission purposes until it gets approved as a CPT code. Most important thing to recognize about category three codes is in general, and when I say in general, probably 80 to 85% of the time, they are not covered by third party insurance. It doesn't mean you don't submit them to the insurance carrier. It just means that you'll want to collect from the patient with an ABN form, and I'll go over that later as well, to ensure that you can get paid when you're submitting it because the claim has a very, very high chance of getting rejected while it's a temporary use or a new technology code. So office visits are the you know, biggest thing that we provide. Remember, there's three different kinds of office visits. There are the ophthalmic codes, there are the evaluation and management codes, and then there's the HICVIX level two code, the S codes. Remember that we're not going to pay attention to S codes. They have no role in medical eye care whatsoever. So we're going to focus just on the ophthalmic codes and on the uh, uh, E&M codes. Why is it important to use the right code? First of all, it has to match the patient's presentation. So if I have a patient coming in and saying they've got symptoms of you know, dry eye, I don't hop in and do a comprehensive eye exam. That would be totally inappropriate. If a patient has complaints about dry eye, I would probably do a 99,000 code that's going to be more focused on that part of the anatomy to determine what's going on. So compliance and economics, it does make a big, big difference on how you select your codes to use. Carver, you might have a question. Is that why you're here? I do. I have our first question for the night, and that's perfectly related to coding, so perhaps you can answer this throughout the next section. Uh, if I have a patient presenting with dry eye-related symptoms, uh, should it be the primary diagnosis? If there are also refractive issues going on, uh, should those codes be included as well? Great. So the uh, the I guess the, I'd ask a question back hypothetically, right? So why are we doing a refraction, right? If a patient's coming in with dry eye symptoms, we're going to do a dry eye examination. We're gonna focus on acuity. We're gonna look at the anatomy of the front of the eye, and I'm going to make an assessment that way. I don't know that we necessarily have to do a refraction at that point in time in that patient's care. That's not why they presented to you. Uh, you can certainly do a pinhole to rule out refractive, you know, pinhole acuity or something like that to rule out a refractive error or something. So I would go down the 99,000 path immediately at that point in time. And then your primary diagnosis driving that examination would be whatever dry eye related uh, diagnosis that you found. And then you do your encounter and your dry eye diagnosis to the medical carrier. The refractive portion of things wouldn't necessarily even raise its head. Perfect. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you. Uh, yep. When you talk about getting giving patients options for treatment, not based off of insurance or what they can afford, but what the patient needs, uh, should we note that uh, we gave the uh, the patient this option and uh, show what the patient decided to do? Absolutely. So think about this. When you meet with your doctor, your doctor might go to go over three or four different things. And they may say, Carver, <clears throat> here's what your diagnosis is. There's a number of different things that we can use to treat that, right? We have a range of different types of things. One, two, three, and four. If it was my personal choice, my personal recommendation would be option number three. Okay, why would I like option number three? I think we're gonna get the most effective results based upon your specific examination findings okay for what you have now i can have you work with my uh, insurance department to see how much payment assistance you can get for that and what your policy covers it doesn't it doesn't change my recommendations right and then if you say well john my insurance only you know i talked to your insurance department and the insurance carrier said that they could only pick up 50 percent of it then i'd say well carver you have a decision to make your eyes right I've made my recommendation. And then we would note all of that in the record, of course, because we would wanna make sure that we disclosed everything to the patient, made our recommendation. The patient made a decision that was maybe counter to our recommendation or partial or something, you know? And don't forget there's other options that we have as well for things for people to be pay, you know, to pay us care credit and all sorts of other types of things that, uh, you know, we have uh, available to us today. Perfect. 
that's uh, thank you so much for that answer. And keep those questions coming, everyone. Okay, great. So I'm going to move on. So let's just talk about the ophthalmic exams. Why do I say we don't really want to jump into a comprehensive exam the very first time we always see a patient? Because remember, a comprehensive exam is the highest level of service that we can do. It's a complete evaluation of the entire visual system, right? It means accommodative, binocularity types of testing, all of those sorts of things as well, right? Remember, dilation is not included in it and my, as a mandatory element, all of that sort of thing. But it always includes the initiation of a diagnostic and treatment program. An intermediate ophthalmic exam is a, either a new condition or complications arising from a pre-existing condition that you're dealing with, right? You have necessary elements, but it also can involve dilation if required, right? Um, and it also requires the initiation of a diagnostic and treatment program. So while we tend to always think, right, as you know, optometrists, we always tend to think, oh, I've got to do a comprehensive eye exam. I would tell you if you're a dry eye subspecialist and you're not performing a routine eye exam on a patient, you know, like a VSP or an IMED exam where they require the 92,000 code, I would tell you that the 99s are much more appropriate for your dry eye presentations uh, most of the time, okay? So I also wanted to talk about um, telehealth. Right, so telehealth is pretty big today, and we're going to go through some other slides very quickly here because I don't want to make it a formal thing on telehealth. But remember, all the evaluation and management codes are, uh, you know, eligible for telehealth. We have a virtual check-in, and we have a virtual image review. We have online digital evaluations. We have telephone services. We have interprofessional consults that you can get paid for talking to your colleague or peer on how you might treat a dry eye patient, you can get paid for that and they can get paid for that and the patient has to, pay, you know, all of these types of things. Telehealth is really big. What's most important to recognize is the ophthalmic codes, any of the 92,000 codes are not eligible for telehealth services. So if we look at evaluation management codes, remember you've got five different levels of service, right? Um, if you got you know, the equivalence between the new patient and the established patient uh, types of things. Remember what currently is driving your coding level for the 99s, and this is gonna change on January 1, by the way. Um, we're gonna do, we have to do our history, our physical exam and medical decision-making. Those three components determine the 99,000 code that we're going to end up with today. Going forward, that's gonna change. If I start to think about what I can do on a 99,000 code visit, right, via telehealth, right, looking at an image from somebody holding a, you know, holding a device up that they're, you know, you're guiding them and we're looking at their eye and they had pointing the flashlight and all of that type of thing, right? I want you to start thinking about what are you going to be able to do out of it? You're gonna get VAs or some systems that you can use to check VAs. You can look at the adnexa. Maybe you could do EOMs by guiding somebody's finger or having them follow your finger, perhaps. Um, looking at the conch, cornea, maybe, pupils, maybe, right? So it's going to be a pretty uh, basic or low level examination. But on some things, we should be able to be able to arrive at least at a 99201 or a 99212 examination if it was an established patient, maybe even a little bit higher, just depending on the technology that you're able to employ in your practice on doing that. But when I start to see patients uh, or practitioners that are starting to 99203s and 04s and they're doing it via a webcam, uh, I think that those are ripe for audit, and I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on those types of things uh, overall. So living in the world of telehealth, right, we have virtual check-in services. So, you know, this is an evaluation. So if a patient uh, wanted to just send you an image to look at, right, they recorded something, a video or a picture, and they emailed it to you and they said, can you look at this? And they're already an existing patient of yours, right? So you can interpret it, right, with the follow-up. Okay, as long as you didn't follow up with the patient in the next 24 hours, didn't relate from an E&M visit in the previous seven days, right? All of these kind of rules that go through, you can then uh, get paid $12.27 for Medicare for that on average, right? Remember, this requires a patient verbal consent when you're doing this, right? If the image is not of sufficient uh, quality for you to make a diagnosis, you can't bill for it. So you got to have the patient resubmit another image. If you're going to do a brief communication check-in, call the patient. Hey, how are you doing? Are the medications I prescribed working well? How are your eyes feeling? Are you still getting, <clears throat> does your vision still, you know, 
uh, vary when you blink. You know, all these types of things that you want to follow up to see how they're doing for dry eye. A G2012, right, is a great thing. $14.80 just has to be, you know, a short visit, generally about five to 10 minutes of overall medical discussion. Again, it's an established patient that you're doing, a, if this is in lieu of a follow-up examination that where they would come back into your office or you would do a virtual uh, thing overall, because this can be done by phone or by video, okay? Virtual check-in services are to only establish patients, right? Uh, on at least annual basis, you have to get verbal consent provided in lieu of an office visit. Now remember this, uh, the current public health emergency that we're in right now changed a lot of things. Uh, there's just a whole new thing released by the Trump administration today on uh, trying to make you know, most of these telehealth things permanent going forward. We'll see where that is. I don't think that the HIPAA free portal is gonna last. I don't think that Skype or FaceTime is gonna last. You're gonna have to use a platform that has HIPAA security but I'm thinking that the location requirements and all of those sorts of things are going to really uh, be easier to comply with and it's going to open up the world of telehealth a lot more. We talk about an online digital evaluation, okay? Newer established patient. Uh, Carver, I'm going to get through these three codes and then we'll take your question, okay? So um, again, established patient, these are time cumulative time. So if I spend five to 10 minutes over a seven day period of time with a patient, that's a 99421. If I go, you know, at the last code, 99423, if I spend more than 21 minutes over a seven day period of time conversing back and forth with the patient, you know, that's a 99423. Go ahead. All right. Um, in the cases of telehealth and just kind of in general, how do you define the term general medical observation in terms of what we'd record in the patient exam? Uh, general medical observation is the same thing as mood and effect. So general medical observation is what's applied to a 92,000 code. It's the same thing as mood and effect is in the 99,000 code. You want to make sure that the patient knows who they are, where they are, what they're doing there, right? Some sort of cognitive assessment, uh, uh, general medical orientation. Perfect. And uh, this goes back to a little bit earlier, but what is, uh, say you have a patient that scored high on the uh, speed dry eye assessment, uh, what sort of language can you use to uh, recommend undergoing a dry eye medical exam? So then if you've got, you know, the speed is going to be identifying symptomology, right? So you're going to want to be able to do that. And we're going to talk about some point of care testing, things like inflammadry and and uh, osmolarity that you should have standing orders in your practice for. As far as I'm concerned, those tests are kind of like vital tests, you know, vital signs that we would do for the ocular surface, right? And you can have standing orders and anybody who presents with dry eye symptoms can automatically have that test. So now that I've got a symptom and I've got a clinical test, that's gonna help to drive whatever else I'm gonna be doing with that patient. Perfect, thank you so much. You bet. Okay, so telephone services. Medicare also opened up halfway through the pandemic, right? Telephone services. Now you'd probably say, what the heck is the difference between the virtual check-in and telephone services? Well, prior to the pandemic, there was a big difference. You didn't get paid for telephone services. Uh, during the pandemic, now you get paid for telephone services. But I was just reading today in that Medicare bulletin that the Trump administration uh, released, and they said that they are probably not going to continue paying for telephone services after the public health emergency is over. Now, they just extended the PHE another 90 days, so that's going to take us through, you know, October. But um, it's one of those things that uh, they have said that they're probably not going to be paying for telephone services going forward. So. Um, Anyways, there's different codes for those as well, again, based upon time of conversation uh, that you would have. Okay, interprofessional consults, right? Two sides of a consult, there's the requesting doctor, there's the doctor presenting the consultation, right? So remember that the patient has to give verbal consent because the patient is typically gonna have two copays to pay, one for the requesting physician, one for the consulting physician. The benefit of this is, is that the patient gets the benefit of a consultant without having to do an actual other visit at all. So it's one of those things that they're gonna have that benefit without having to travel or, or do anything. So when the consulting physician is providing a verbal and written report, they would use 99446, 447, 448, or 449. 
if the consulting physician is only providing a written report, they do 99451, okay? So those are the codes for the consulting physician. The requesting physician always uses 99452 and they get paid 3753, okay? So, um, but it's a nice way to be able to consult with your colleagues. It's a nice way for you to build revenue in your practice. If you already have a dry eye practice and you're helping those around you, uh, learn how to establish and uh, do further dry eye uh, care. So here's kind of just a summary uh, type of a thing that we had, I had put together for you. It's kind of nice. Um, when we talked earlier about established patients, that's how it was, uh, you know, prior to the COVID-19 emergency, but now it's a new or established on, on all those different uh, headings there. Okay, so moving away from telehealth, modifiers, right? So the GT modifier was eliminated back in 2018, so we're not going to be using that anymore. Obviously, we're going to be focusing on using just the modifier 95 when you're providing a telehealth service, right? If you want to look for any other procedures that require the 95 modifier, it's in Appendix P of the CPT book, okay? Place of service codes, going back and forth on this. So when we uh, were talking about telehealth services, it was always place of service two, uh, because that's the designator for telehealth. That has now changed. Some carriers are now wanting you to actually use the designator of your office, even though you're not actually at your office. Um, why? Have no idea. Um, but those, those bulletins have come down, and I think it just was helping with claim rejection and helping to get people paid uh, during this uh, ep, you know, uh, pandemic that we were going through. So a couple of changes coming up in 2020 and 2021. So this year, as you know, um, if you're going to be doing things uh, with mybography, you can no longer use 92285 when you're performing mybography. Mybography now has its own code. You can tell by the letter T, it's a category three code. And so if you're doing pure mybography, right, you know, with infrared or simultaneous reflective or transluminated light, you're now going to have to use 0507T and it may not be covered by the insurance carrier because it's a category three code. So again, one of those things you have to pay attention to. Remember we talked about compliance, coding, right? Compliance and reimbursement. Those are types of things we really have to pay attention to. And then for those of you who are doing uh, thermal devices, tear care, uh, the uh, uh, thermal lid device by Site Sciences, uh, did develop a new category three code, 0563T, that specifically describes their technology. So you would want to use that um, if you're going to be working with uh, tear care. Okay, 2021, January 1. History and the physical examination elements are no longer going to be required for coding. So you don't, you're just going to do a, an appropriate history or an appropriate examination. You no longer have to have the four requirements for doing that. You're going to be able to code your E&M codes based on two things, and you get to choose medical decision making or the amount of time that you spend with the patient. So you know, a patient comes in, I don't have to, I still do my history, I still do my physical exam, but I don't have to worry about what level of history, what level of exam, I can just record how much time I spent with the patient and that will tell me what level of code I'm going to use. Or I can use just medical decision-making and that'll tell me what level of code I need to use. There's been uh, modifications to medical decision-making. There'll be, uh, I just wrote a feature article for review that'll be out shortly talking about the different changes in medical decision-making, but they have redefined some things, made it a lot easier. 99201 is no longer going to be a code, right? There is no longer 99201, and there's going to be new prolonged service codes. So if you go over the uh, highest amount of time that you can spend, you can now do a, a prolonged service code and get paid in addition to the 99,000 code that you're doing. Okay, let's get a little more specific into some dry eye types of things, okay? First and foremost, on chief complaint, we're going to talk about medical necessity, doing special ophthalmic procedures, surgical codes, and then clinical point of care testing. So the chief complaint, remember, I said the first, the most important question that you ever ask is, why, do you, why are you here today if it's a new patient, right? Why do you need to see the doctor? And then did you record, if they're an established patient, why you're having that patient come back? 
because remember the coverage of services by a medical insurance company is determined or dependent upon the purpose of the visit, not on the diagnosis. So if a patient came in and they had no chief complaint and you found something wrong, that is not covered by the medical carrier. You have to find out why they're there and they have to have a medical complaint, right? They have to have complaint or symptoms of an eye disease or injury. Then they'll have coverage by their medical carrier, whether you find something or whether you don't. It's the purpose of the visit that determines coverage, nothing else, okay? And again, we talked about the two different types of things, originating with the patient or having the physician, having the patient come back for a specific reason. Okay, and then again, the specific language, if you don't record that down, the patient's not gonna have coverage or it won't, the visit won't stand up to audit. <clears throat> Medical necessity. So I have to define necessity because I find people wanting to redefine it <laughs> all the time. So medical necessity means that, that it's something indispensable. You need it, it's a requirement, it's imperative. So when you're saying that a test is necessary to do, it means that you really can't diagnose something or recommend a treatment plan without doing that particular test. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like going, well, John, I probably already have a test that shows me something, but I do a lot of tests just to make sure. That's called confirmatory testing. Insurance carriers don't pay for confirmatory testing because it doesn't meet the standard of medical necessity. Carver. Hi. So, I have one that's actually talking a question about some medical necessity, maybe not the definition of it, um, but the process of proving medical necessity, uh, where this doctor has a new patient uh, that has a history of uh, other treatments by other dry eye professionals. Um, do I pers does this doctor need to personally prescribe these lower cost treatments before billing out a higher cost code if they've pre uh, previously uh, been ineffective with other doctors? Okay, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and I apologize for the ambiguity of my answer. Um, it generally depends on what the treatments were. So if you can identify or the patient can identify that they've tried, for example, many different types of artificial tears, you don't need to go back and repeat all of that. You can note that the patient has tried artificial tears. You can verify the schedule that they've done. You can note it that, you know, they did it be, you know, uh, QID or whatever it was uh, that they did uh, before you move on. But you also have to repeat some things. For example, let's say I was going to move away from uh, a cyclosporin like Restasis or Zydra or something like that, and I was now going to move on to an amniotic membrane because I've got some severe corneal problems, I would probably want to try uh, that cyclosporin again or other type of an agent to demonstrate before I did a high-priced item like a Procara on the ocular surface. So sometimes it depends. The other thing that happens, of course, is time. So after you see that patient the first time, you should definitely be requesting records from the prior practitioner so then you can verify and validate what was actually done before. Perfect. I think in this situation, uh, this might be one of those cases where you email Dr. Mpankis with the specifics and uh, you can maybe get a more precise answer in this case. Yeah, I'd be happy to help. Perfect. Uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, Lipiflow is a very similar treatment to uh, to tear care. Uh, would you still not use the tear care code or could you use the tear care code with Lipiflow? You cannot. Lipiflow has its own code, 0207T. So remember, the code specifically describes the technology. So you can't use one technology and borrow another code, right? Um, I'll just put it this way. It costs companies a lot of money to develop codes, to get a code through the AMA and all of that. So when they describe the code, they create the code. You'll notice on the tear care code that I showed you earlier, it was very specific for their technology. It will not apply to any other thermal lid warming that's out there. And that's done with purpose, right? I mean, it's done so they can specifically identify uh, and define the procedure that was done. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, so here's the definitions on your screen right now of medical necessity. 
All I really want you to do is if you can tell me what you want to do with the patient, when you want to do it, and why you want to do it, that's sufficient for an auditor, right? What you want to do with the patient, when you want to do it, and why you want to do it. Those three things. I want the patient to come back in one week for this procedure because of this reason. That's sufficient because your clinical notes should support that conclusion or that statement of medical necessity overall, okay? So that's when I say the medical record must clearly demonstrate that what you're doing is necessary to diagnose or treat it. Just tell the record what you want to do, why you want to do it, and when it needs to be done. And that will help back you up very much on an audit type of a situation. When we're doing special ophthalmic testing, right, all these tests have specific codes. So if I'm using an Oculus unit and I want to perf uh, perform topography, I can use that unit for topography. I can use it for my biography. I can use it for other types of things, right? So I don't have to have a specific instrument, you know, uh, limited to one thing. There's all these multi types of instruments out there uh, that are very good. But when I'm doing that, remember these codes are always billed in addition to an office visit, okay? They are billed in addition to an office visit. And it's important because the CPT book clearly says any special ophthalmic service may be reported in addition to the general ophthalmological services or E&M services. So if the carrier ever tries to tell you, hey, you're trying to unbundle something and that other something has its own specific CPT code, you can politely tell them, you know, here you go. Um, that's not true. I'm allowed to bill this procedure distinctly and separately in addition to my office visit because it has its own CPT code. Again, remember that you, know, you can do whatever you want, when you want to do it, if you have medical necessity, you've communicated to the patient, and if you need to, obtain an ABN if you know that they don't have coverage. So now let's talk about standing orders versus ordered procedures, right? So I'm a big believer that these point of service, uh, point of care tests, and we'll get to them a little bit later, should have standing orders. So if I have a patient that presents for dry eye, and I've got symptoms of dry eye before I've even seen the patient, I can have a standing order at my front desk that that patient gets a dry, uh, inflammatory and or osmolarity test prior to me seeing them. Why? Because I just need a patient's symptom of dry eye for that to occur. Now, those two tests, either osmolarity or uh, uh, testing for MMP9, are key, right? Because they help open up the gateway to let you see things that you can't just see by observing the tear film alone by uh, via slit lamp examination. So those two things are important, and they can actually drive your other types of testing or other types of protocols that you may do as you go forward. So that's a standing order. If I have ordered testing, that means I have to physically see something going on. For example, I have to uh, be able to, you know, push against the meibomian glands, see that they're clogged to order my biography, right? So I have to have a finding, then an order. Certain things I can have a symptom and then a standing order. So that's the difference, uh, important differences between those two. Remember, what we can and cannot do together on the same day of service is dependent upon things called the National Correct Coding Initiative, or what we call the CCI edits. These rules govern about a million plus different combinations of CPT codes that can or cannot be performed on the same date of service. The most common one that's out there that does not apply to dry eye is doing OCT and retinal photography on the same day. You know you can't do that. Um, and so uh, those are the rules that govern these. So you have to be cognizant, even in dry eye types of things, if you're doing certain things uh, like anterior segment OCT with topography or something, you may have to double check on that to make sure that you can do those two things on the same day. And ABN, and I will just make sure everybody has a quick heads up on this. There is a brand new ABN that is due for use September 1st. So go to CMS's website, contact me, I'll send you the uh, updated version of it. But if you're going to be using an ABN, there's a brand new uh, version of it. Remember an ABN is nothing more than a uh, financial informed consent. And so that way you can make sure that if the patient doesn't have insurance coverage or the carrier is going to deny the procedure, that you have to have a signed ABN on file before the procedure is done. Right? You got to get the patient's consent before you do the procedure. Then 
the carrier will legally transfer the patient responsibility or the, the remaining amount, the non-covered amount, to the patient for appropriate responsibility. So if you use an ABN correctly, guess what? You will get paid 100% of the time for 100% of what you do. You will never have to write something off to zero if an ABN is done properly, okay? So you have to protect yourself really through proper charting. If you do that, you will have very little audit risk. You'll have higher revenues by using the codes that describe what you're doing, right? And you can sleep well at night knowing that you're doing these uh, things appropriately, all right? So again, interpretation and reports that go along with your special ophthalmic tests, what are really important, clinical findings, comparative data, and how does it affect the management of that patient going forward? Those are the three big things that you want to have on your interpretation and report. Pertinent findings, comparative data if you've done earlier tests and now comparing it, and then how is it going to affect the care going forward? If we're dealing with surgical procedures, the only thing I want to tell you and make sure that you understand is that when we're doing a surgical procedure, an office visit is not billable on the same day as that minor surgical procedure. So if the surgical procedure has a global period of less than 90 days, right, it's defined as minor surgery, and you cannot bill an office visit on the same day as a procedure uh, that has a global period of less than 90 days. If it's a major surgery, which uh, nothing that we do uh, currently on the front of the eye would qualify for that. Um, but if we had major surgery, you could. Global periods were slated to go away in 2017. That's now been postponed. It was supposed to be 2021 that they were going away. But now with the pandemic and everything else going on, I don't know when that is going to shift. So I can't uh, conclusively say that they're going away in 2021 any longer. Remember, you have to have an operative report with any surgical procedure that you're doing. Here's some uh, things that should be on an operative report. You don't have to have everything, but generally your diagnosis, who did the surgery, what the procedure was, the description of it, and any discharge um, orders that you have, uh, those would be important to have in as well. And then point of care clinical lab testing, right? So these don't get paid according to the relative value system that we currently have under Medicare. They're paid underneath a, a separate a CLIA uh, lab system payment system. Remember that in order to get your CLIA waiver, your office has to be designated as a uh, clinical lab and one of the doctors in your office has to be designated as a clinical lab director. If those two things are done, Right, you can now do clinical lab testing in your practice. And for Medicare, there's no patient copay or coinsurance that is billed for those. Medicare covers these lab tests in full. They're not big money makers, so I'll go over that reimbursement here in just a second. But there are uh, specific ABNs that you can use for lab tests as well that will specify the lab test, what it does, just to ensure that you do get paid uh, for the lab test no matter what. So if we're talking about osmolarity, currently by the tier lab uh, company that's out there 83861 the qw means that the test has been approved by medicare to be a clia wave test you bill it on a monocular or unilateral uh, basis uh, so you always use an rt or an lt modifier you get paid 22 dollars 48 per test okay if you're using uh inflamadry 83516 is the current uh, code. It also has its CLIA waiver. That's why you include the QW in the coding. Again, unilateral, RT and LT, it gets paid $11.53 per test. So I know that the cost of administering both these tests is below the reimbursement. So I know you're making some money, but I think it's only like $5 to $7 per eye. But, you know, if I start to look at that and I say, you know, a patient comes in, I've got a standing order, a patient has symptoms uh, via their uh, speed test, you know, questionnaire or whatever, they now have a test, I'm automatically getting, right, for another $45 if I'm doing this or another $25 or so if I'm doing this, you know, so um, it, it does add up, you know, on an aggregate basis. So when I do a clinical lab test, what do I have to do? I have to note the sign or symptom that drove the ordering of the test. I have to specifically identify which test I'm gonna do. I record the test and say it was normal versus abnormal, establish a management plan, and then document or sign that the lab tests were done, all right, or that I've interpreted those. So those are the five things I have to do when I do a point of care clinical lab test. 
Now, I want to spend some time on the economics here real quick. So I'm going to go to a, a tool that I've developed that kind of shows you the economic potential of this, okay? And it's really important for us to kind of understand. So I'm going to kind of just walk through a couple of different things here. <clears throat> and so, you know, everybody can put their own number in. I think that, you know, if you look at most of the studies, you'll see that dry eye occurs in about 25% in the natural population, right? And so that means if there's 330 million people in the United States today, and 25% have it, that means there's, you know, 82 million people walking around right now with signs and symptoms of dry eye. My understanding is, and my guess would be, is that now that people are on their devices so much more, I'll bet you that percentage of dry eye symptoms has gone up significantly. And we could do that in scenario number two. Now, if you're the average practice out there seeing about 3,500 individuals in a given year, that means that there's 875 individuals walking through your doors right now without doing any marketing, doing anything uh, uh, in addition to that, that is, uh, you know, driving this, okay? So an office visit, a 99213 pays about $75 national average for Medicare. So I go through and I say, so if I'm looking at a dry eye patient, how many follow-up visits per year do I do, right, on a patient that's not undergoing punctal occlusion? And I'll tell you why that in just a second. The national average is three visits per year, okay? Now, why do I say that and break that out separate from a punctal occlusion patient, because remember, a punctal occlusion patient has a 10-day global period, and a couple of those follow-up visits may very well fall within that global period and not be separately re reimbursed. Medicare pays about $755 for an, an individual who undergoes a um, diagnostic occlusion and then a permanent occlusion, so a temporary occlusion and a permanent occlusion. Um, about 755 non Medicare carriers, about 1152. Nationwide, the average of individuals undergoing punctal occlusion is only about 5%. So now I look at practice demographics, right? And I say, gosh, you know, what if your patient, you know, patient base is 50% Medicare, all right? And let's pretend that right now you're not doing any osmolarity testing, you're not doing any inflammatory testing, anything like that, okay? But let's say that you do maybe are making some money on your dry eye patients. You're selling nutraceuticals. You're doing something along those lines. So let's say maybe you're making $75 per year per patient on those types of things. And let's say you don't even have a thermal device in your office right now, like a, um, a tear care device or any of the others that are out there. Just based upon what we know, that's bringing another $294,000 of potential to your practice, okay? That's pretty significant. Let's do another scenario. Let's say the dry eye is much more frequent than 25%. Let's just say signs and symptoms occur in 40% of your patient base. You're still seeing 3,500 patients per year. You're still doing three follow-up visits, okay? You're still doing 5% of that. But now let's say you have 50% Medicare again, okay? But now let's say you test every Medicare patient that walks in the door for doing that. Because most individuals of 65 years of age or greater have signs or symptoms of dry eye, okay? And let's say that the commercial carriers out there pay about 85% of the Medicare rates, okay? And if I look at percentage of non-Medicare patients who I'm testing for osmolarity, let's say I'm getting a pretty good hit rate of 60% of those individuals, okay, who are non uh, under 65, I'm getting that. And let's repeat that same sort of thing for inflammatory. So we'll do 100% of our Medicare patients, 85% uh, reimbursement for commercial carriers, and I'm going to test 60% of those individuals, right? I'm still gonna get my $75 per year. I might get a little higher than that because now that I know if they have inflammation or uh, things, I may end up doing some types of live treatments, brooder masks, things like that, and doing things. Let's say I'm gonna get 125. And now let's say I have a thermal device and let's say I'm only doing two procedures per week. That's another $653,000. I'm not talking about 
comprehensive eye exams. I'm not talking about contact lens fits. I'm not talking about topography, mybography, any other special testing that I know you're going to have more revenue on. I'm just talking about the basics here that would be driving some of the economics for you and your practice to start really thinking about how I'm going to pick up dry eye as a subspecialty in my practice. Because I really think dry eye is, is really out there. It's prevalent. We've got a natural built in. It doesn't re, you know, require a lot of instrumentation. You can buy great you know, devices like the Oculus device that is a multi uh, testing instrument. So you can have one footprint and do multiple tests on there and produce great reports in their crystal report module and all of that type of thing, right? So it's not a huge investment to get into and you have a lot of patience with these problems. The other thing I'm just going to mention on economics really quickly is one thing. Today, in a world of reduced patient volume, the comprehensive eye exam by a managed vision care company that's paying you $55 really isn't going to cut it very well, right? It's not going to be something that you're going to be able to make a profit on uh, very, very easily. Why? Because your chair costs just exceed the you know, the, the money that you're getting and your profit margin on those, you're really using your eye exams as a loss leader. So it's going to force you to start to examine business practices where you're going to accept higher reimbursements or you want to be having higher net procedures. Dry eye is a perfect vehicle to bring in your practice to really do that. Again, like I said earlier, what we do if we're going to incorporate a specialty, though, is we really have to stop making clinical decisions based upon patient coverage, right? Give the patients the choice. Make your recommendations based upon the best science that you know and do it in earnest with helping them, right? You can't cure dry eye, but you can effectively manage it for that patient and make them much more comfortable and really improve their quality of life. But if we're always bound by what's covered by an insurance carrier, we're never going to be able to really give the patient the care that they need. And the second thing I want you to think about on that is even if something is covered by their carrier, generally that patient has not met their deductible yet. So they're still paying out of pocket, even though it might apply to their deductible. So economics, if you're making an economic decision for your patient, that's not a good choice to do. You're never going to win in that situation. So with that, Carver, I'd say thank you for the opportunity, and I'd be open for answering any additional questions that have arisen. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Mpakis. That's been uh, very informative, and I've definitely learned a lot. Uh, we only have a few more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and give everyone a reminder to go ahead and enter in your questions uh, into the chat box, and uh, we have a few minutes to get those answered. All right. So we have a doctor that has a keratograph and has been using it to uh, kind of establish a baseline with a few kind of standing tests that they have everyone perform. Um, when they start to notice a deviation from the baseline, uh, at what point uh, do the exams become billable? <laughs> Well, you kind of put yourself into a tough spot. So if you're doing your examinations first without any medical necessity to them, how are you coding and having those tests done? Because you're going to code them exactly the same each time. The first time the patient's going to pay for it, the second time the carrier may pay for it if you need to do it a second time. So you're going to have to demonstrate that repeating it is medically necessary, first of all. And then you're going to have to think about limitations or uh, interval spans in between your testing to determine whether that is appropriate or not. So it's a hard question for me to answer because I don't know what you're doing right now, but if you want to take me offline and you know uh, email me privately about that and I gotcha. could learn me, a little bit more specifically. Read the question a little bit more specifically. Uh, if I have patients that I have pay out of pocket for dry eye exams and build a patient history with um, to establish base measurements or a baseline of measurements um, if there is a significant finding um, yeah what point does it become billable so your findings have nothing to do with it becoming billable perfect okay it was the purpose of ordering the test in the first place that makes it billable perfect. that's that establishment of medical necessity that we are talking about perfect excellent 
Um, we have the question, can I get a copy of the slide presentation? Uh, I'll answer that. Um, all of you that are in attendance tonight and everyone that's registered, so even those people that aren't here, uh, are going to receive a follow-up email in a few days. And uh, that'll have a link to watch this very presentation so you can watch it again at a later date. And uh, you can look at I any of the I can't believe you guys are going to watch it again. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of uh, details which are, uh, I, I certainly didn't memorize all of this, but I'm definitely going to be referencing this for uh, months and probably years to come. Great. Any other questions, Carver? Uh, yeah, uh, this is actually a question from Oculus, um, which is how, in terms of billing in a practice, uh, what do you find the best way to implement a uh, care to graph in a practice? So I think the thing is, is it's nice is you have to determine, you know, first of all, is dry eye a specialty area you want to go into? And then you start to look at the subsets of the testing that the instrument actually does, because there's a lot of, there's a broad scope out there. I think that the Keratograph does a really great job because it combines a lot of different things into a single footprint, you know, where you can actually analyze tear film, you can measure quantitatively, uh, you know, the meniscus better, uh, you can do mybography, all of these types of things, you know, you can get a really great visual image. Plus, I think one of the strongest points about your instrumentation is your crystal reporting type of function that you guys have, which really summarizes everything really nicely. And in one instrument that takes one, uh, one footprint in an office. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for people that want to uh, learn more about the economics in their own practices. Um, we also have some people asking uh, how they kind of get a hold of that calculator. I assume they just talked to you. Yeah, what was the point? Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, they... uh, that calculator that you walked through where uh, you kind of oh. did the math on the economics of uh, dry eye. Uh, people are interested in seeing uh, how those numbers would play out in their own practice. Could they, uh, should they follow up with you at the email on screen, john yeah. at prmi.com? Yeah, that would be fine, Carver. Um, I just should make it clear, I don't sell that calculator. It's something that I use for my consulting practice. But Perfect. Um, when we do work with a specific client, that's something that we bring into play for them. So that way they can help to understand the dynamics of their own office. Absolutely. All right. That is all the questions we have for tonight. Thank you everyone in attendance for joining us and thank you for sending in your questions uh, and thank you so much Dr. Mpakis uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. You bet. Have a great night everybody. Stay healthy.